Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. Michael Freeman. If you'd like to be a part of the discussion during our live taping, please check us out at youtube.com slash user slash Cur of Anarchy on Mondays at 9 p.m., 6 p.m. Pacific. And you can see the final product on the air at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash of anarchy. And if you're here during the live taping, you can post any question or comment to the new thread we've made or send us a Facebook message directly and we'll certainly get to it. Holly Cogburn runs Homebody, a body care, vanity, and cosmetic products company. She contracts using USD, Bitcoin, and barter. She is proud to say that she started the business without the assistance of bank loans. In her words, fuck bank loans and fuck their interest rates. For the most part, fuck banks. She has paid her startup costs out of pocket and has steadily and sustainably grown from there. She believes in a free, fair, and reputation-based market, relying on word of mouth. So please, find Holly at homebodyco.com or facebook.com slash homebodyco. Um, so we have the roundtable tonight, and we have quite a bit of, or quite a few guests, and two of which are together tonight. Um, I guess we can start with them. Uh, Marcel and Rich, good to see you guys again. Hello. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, Marcel, do you want to introduce yourself? I am Marcel Fontaine. Um, I'm an activist originally from uh, Connecticut. And uh, um, I run the Facebook page LGBT for Gun Rights, and uh, um, and I have a wide Facebook following. And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Uh, Rich. Uh, well, my name is Rich Paul. I'm a uh, mostly cannabis activist and also jury nullification activist. Um, and I'm originally from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I moved to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project. Yeah, and you're both in Keene right now? Yes, that is correct. Nice. nice. Where exactly in Keene are you, and what other li Liberty Media comes out of that building? Well, I, Where, can't, I, I can't say the exact address. Yeah. It's a... Uh, um, but we're in an undisclosed location somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, where of where Free Talk Live is uh, broadcast, and uh, uh, Ladies and Keen comes out of here. Peace News Now comes out of Keen. Uh, Puke and the Gang comes out of Keen. Um, yeah. There's a lot of shows that come out of Keene, and a whole nother set coming out of uh, Manchester. New Hampshire is pretty much the liberty capital of the world these days. Exactly. Or, in, in my humble opinion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've had Liberty Doll on the show a uh, few times. Yay. Hi, Nikki. Hi. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself again? Okay. Um, well, I'm Nikki. Um, I'm in Massachusetts, which is not the liberty capital of the world. <laughs> it's probably one of the anti-liberty capitals of the world. Um, I run the Liberty Doll Facebook page, the blog, the skeleton YouTube channel that has like three videos on it. <laughs> Um, and I'm a psychotherapist and a writer and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Luis, Luis, what's going on? Good to have you back on. Thank you. Thank Happy you, to be right? here. It's only been two weeks. <laughs> That's not bad at all. Um, yeah, uh, can you reintroduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, Luis Fernando. I run a uh, uh, Spain uh, Human, uh, North uh, Texas Cup Walk, Cup Logic, Cup Black Markets Are Beautiful, uh, VS for Voluntary. I also am uh, the host of Anarchast uh, Spanish, and uh, I'm a consultant, and we teach uh, basically voluntarism in the corporate world, 
and uh, most of our clients are in the Forbes 100 companies, uh, best companies to work for. Right on. Um, yeah, so, so we have quite the lineup. Um, yeah, so I think the first thing that we wanted to talk about, Michael and I, um, is the, the thing is uh, I think that there's reason to be hopeful due to education. Uh, people are starting new blogs or starting new web shows. Um, uh, and they're coming out of their own boxes and they're being strong and strong-willed and uh, instead of um, keeping all their information to themselves they're speaking out about it, spreading the message of liberty um, but yet I think that economics is still going to play out and the dollar is still going to collapse um, people are still status and uh, <clears throat> don't really see that this is going to happen um, whether they want it to happen or not, or whether they believe it will not happen or not. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, so there's uh, positive and negative, but what's your um, perspective on this? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty thick um, question. This is, yeah, I, I, this is I, definitely I, the topic tonight, though. <laughs> yeah. Pretty loaded. You know, um, as you know, I'm a huge fan of Doug Casey, and like he's you know, his message has been talking about for longer than I've been alive is how everything, you know, how the dollar is going to collapse probably since 1982 and it's been gradually happening, you know, so I think that yes, it will happen and um, I I just see that, you know, the message of uh, voluntarism, the message of libertarianism is uh, reaching the mainstream and yeah, sometimes it's uh, not a good sight, you know, because, um, you know, they tend to mock the uh, message, they tend to mock us and, uh, you know, using uh, slander and all sorts of things. But the point that I'm trying to make is kind of like uh, Mah Mahanda Gandhi said that first they laugh at you and then they fight you and then you win. So we're kind of in that era, you know, we're in that stage where uh, we need to really get together and uh, try to spread the message. And I think that's pretty interesting because in the work that I do, you know, uh, Monday through Friday, um, just the idea that corporations, you know, I, I maybe probably, what, a couple of months ago I went to the uh, Conscious Capitalism CEO Summit and it was over 200 CEOs and there was basically what they were saying is government sucks, they don't work, we need to do something, basically privatize everything. We need to create, you know, uh, systems and uh, communities where we are able to put bring a lot of ourselves, you know, like uh, taking the idea that... Uh, they need to be, empower people to be able to do more. So in other words, privatizing the world, which is awesome. So imagine this is happening with like, and it was like the CEO of Chipotle and John Mackey from Whole Foods and some other fancy dudes. So like this is already happening at the very high level. And from there we take, you know, like the idea that there's a ton of people blogging, a bunch of people with um, pages. And so to me, that's really hopeful. So yeah, the dollar is going to collapse. It's collapsing. It's going away. You know, the BRIC nations are trying to do away with the dollar as a currency of trade. So I think that that's actually kind of a an exciting time, you know, because we can actually get together and do a... Um, I think that statism is on its way out. So that's, right. that's what, the way I see it. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I like it. Uh, Nikki, uh, what are your pers uh, perspectives and thoughts? Um, well, I, it's hard to say and, and to make a prediction of where I think voluntarism or anarchism and statism are going to go um, within this next year, but I, as long as I've been paying attention at least, I've sort of noticed a trend where a bunch of things go down and everything escalates for a little while and then it sort of plateaus out and people stop paying attention and then something else comes up and there's everybody gets upset about that and there's talk about you know governments doing this wrong or the police are doing that wrong and then everyone sort of forgets about it again um, 
when I first started getting into um, the ideas of liberty, it was um, the NDAA that was signed, all that was going on. There was um, the controversies about Ron Paul not getting airtime in the debates, and everyone was getting all riled up about it. And then it sort of peer petered out, and then there was... Um, you know, like the Sandy Hook shooting, Newtown shooting, and then everyone was all upset about gun control, and then that sort of petered out. So um, I think right now we're definitely in a period of escalation again with um, everything that's been going on in Ferguson, and then now the cops in New York that are sort of on strike, kind of, um, and really just showing people mm -hmm. that they're not needed. Do I think yeah, that... Exactly. Do I think this is the ultimate thing that's going to make people wake up? I don't think so. I think it's um, statism is far too deep and entrenched. But um, I, I'm thinking in particular of, um, I think it was Larkin Bowes that posted a graphic the other day where he had asked people about when they had come into voluntarism um, or anarchism, and he documented the years that everyone answered, and right now is the biggest amount um, of any time, really. Um, when he showed it on the graph, uh, 2014 had the highest bar for the most people that had found out about voluntarism and anarchism and identified as such. So I think that's really hopeful. Um, I know that I've been telling more people about it, even in my personal life. I've been a little bit more vocal since uh, some family members accidentally stumbled onto my work. <laughs> so I sort of had to air it out a little bit. Um, but so I've used that to um, talk about it more in my personal life. I don't use the word anarchy because people get scared by it. Um, I usually say voluntarism. But um, so I think that there's hope, and I think that we'll definitely take some steps forward this year. I don't know if it will be the year, mm -hmm. but yeah. <laughs> I do have to uh, mention the part that um, but when Larkin Rose uh, created that graph a few days ago, uh, even he prefaced it with, uh, you know, it's a very rudimentary graph because he only has 5,000 followers or friends or whatever, and only so many can respond to him at once, that kind of thing. So it's it's got stipulation for that. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I actually didn't even realize that he pulled that many people. Um, I just saw that he had said that he had like asked friends, so I didn't even know that it was that many people that he had asked. Probably. So that's really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's that's awesome. Marcel, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, well, uh, um, as of like you know the whole entire anarchist type of like you know um type of like you know thing go going on like in the uh, and plus uh and plus how libertarianism is going to be like in in 2015. Uh, I do I, I do think that especially with the likes of, like, you know, Ferguson and, and the Eric Garner case and so like that, that is actually waking a lot more people up to the, to, um, to, uh, corruption with, uh, uh with, uh, policing and how law enforcement has, uh, gone beyond the boundaries of, uh, of their intended duties to actually, like, well, well, te technically, if you, if you do the Warren versus DC, then basically they're doing, they're necessarily have an obligation Attack, but um, but but to but to maintain like you know like um a uh the protect protection service, but like yeah um and uh it's just, it's just like it's just with the uh with how things are going now pr pr probably um I don't necessarily see like you know the complete end of state statism there because there will be more like you know status and so that and uh, and I think that's primarily due to to uh on the public school indoctrination and so like that here and there, and uh, so uh, um, so I, I I'm pretty sure that we'll probably get a lot more uh, libertarians this year. But yeah, that's just my, that's just basically my opinion. If you're sleeping in a room with a lot of people, the more people that wake up, the harder it is to stay asleep. And uh, having spent a significant amount of time in jail. 
recently. I've empirically checked that, and it's true. Um, you know, the more people are awake in the day room, the harder it is to stay asleep. Um, so, empirical <laughs> data. When when love gloves go around, there's no staying asleep. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but so I expect to see continued uh, exponential growth in uh, in our ideas, um, and a lot of that depends on how kind our enemies are. And you know, with the Michael Brown shooting, uh, and even not so much Brown, but Garner, really, uh, you know, they've handed us a gold mine because people are waking up to uh, you know at least somewhat to the level of violence and that puts them in a great space to hear the gun in the room argument you know that every uh, and it should be something that we can bring conservatives and, and liberals together on yeah. The Eric Garner, because basically he was killed for engaging in free enterprise. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah exactly. I um, uh, what are you saying, Michael? Your um, mic's off. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the liberals are going to come in on the side of anti-police brutality, civil rights, and the Republicans are going to come in on the side of their. <laughs> fantasy level of what free trade is. You know, they can use the word and toss that around. And maybe sometimes it can even help actual markets. Um, so yeah, it is. It's like a, bi a bipartisan issue. I think that, that the Eric Garner case was cut and dry. It was, it was video recorded cold-blooded murder. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, it, it should yeah. Be unite, but then I find that it just turns into a race-baiting issue, just like every other one, and and then this whole Sony thing happened, and where did police brutality go? Like, where did the whole torture report go? It's it's just like old news already. And, you know, I don't have faith in the media, but I don't want to take I don't want to take your guys your guys time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean there are definitely forces trying to keep things uh, things quiet, but it gets harder and harder, you know. When, the, when your neighbor on both sides hold a new opinion, it's much harder to, uh, to hold on to your old one. Yeah, I was even, like, you know, talking to, to, a, to, a, my, to a fellow peer in my, uh, in my school my, my back at, in Connecticut, and uh, she was actually, um, and, she, and she was, you know, in, in African-American descent, but she, like, you know, she was saying, like, you know, um, all this uh, police corruption and so like that. Like she, she spotted my cop block badge on my bag, and uh, she that developed a conversation saying like you know, um, that um, um, of like you know anti anti police and so like that and anti police brutality and stuff. And uh, I even like you know showed her you know maybe uh, maybe you should read uh, the. Of the most dangerous superstition by Larkin Rose, and you should read like the uh, um, the book by Davy Barker, uh, Authoritarian Sociopathy. I recommended those books, and hopefully she takes advantage of of those and uh, actually gets those type of types of literature to her and try to like make uh, make it understand that the root causes of this uh, is basically uh, through the means of you know. Obeying authority and so like that, and uh, and yeah, and, and she was actually even familiar with the Stanford prison experiment, where basically like they experimented with uh, in uh, in a basement um, of a university. I forgot the name of it though. But I'm actually uh, going to make a video about that experiment. That reminded me, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, they, um, they, uh, she, she was even familiar with that, and that was actually a really good starting point. And I, I even like you know even recommended uh, Henry David Thoreau's uh, Civil Disobedience to her, and hopefully that she takes advantage of those sources. Right. 
what I have to say is really great is that even though the mainstream media and most people are making this um, these police brutality cases into a race issue, there are some people that are sort of like trickling in and seeing the underlying issues. There was a very, 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 very liberal person on my Facebook the other day that was um, complaining about race issues and... Um, you know, I was starting to get into the conversation, and then someone co actually commented, and they're like, look, I just read this article, and there was this guy, Kelly Thomas, you know, that was killed by police, and he was this homeless guy with mental health yeah. issues, and so they actually started researching and found other cases, um, so for them, at least, it did become an issue of, um, you know, the police versus the people, and not just the police versus black people which I thought was really amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and at the same time, you know, I don't try and say that there are no racist cops in America because God knows there are a lot there of racist are. cops There definitely in America. are. <laughs> and, I know, right? And it do, but it does go both ways. Just like people get pulled over for driving while black in a white neighborhood, people also get pulled over for driving while white in a black neighborhood and being yes. a drug dealer. I know, I I know that none of you guys know Rhode Island very well. Uh, I recently lived in Oneyville. <laughs> I recently lived in Oneyville, Rhode Island, which is like the, arguably the most ghetto spot in Rhode Island. And I really lived there because it was close to the VA, but that, that's irrelevant. Um, and I was I was stopped, coerced all the time because they thought that I was there trying to score drugs because, you know, I'm a white kid who sometimes wears collars on my shirt and, and I don't talk with a ghetto drawl, right? And, and I was the victim of the exact same type of racial profiling but on the opposite, you know, side of the spectrum. And I've, I've dealt with that for, for, for four years now. Yeah. My fiance actually grew up in Brockton, which is it, probably the most ghetto place in Massachusetts, aside from Lynn. Um, it's sort of like a third world country, and he has so many stories of times that he got pulled over, um, and immediately the first thing the cops did was ask him what he was doing there and if he was buying drugs. Is, is Pat white? He does look kind of... Um, Ambiguous. Olive Italian, maybe. He is Italian, actually, okay. though he's mostly Irish. Uh, really? Yes. Um, we were actually at this Chinese My restaurant borders. once, and the waitress asked us if he was, um, she goes, you meeks? You meeks? And then she pointed at her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty amazing. So he's, he's pretty ambiguous. <laughs> I want to anyway. uh, move on to uh, uh, the subject of uh, the marathon. Uh, the marathon bombing, because that was, uh, what, uh, almost two years at this point. Um, and they're, you know, having this guy on trial, um, Sanayev. Um, is, so this is big in Boston, because Boston, we were all shut down. Or, well, our, in that general area, Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, we were, they were shut down for like uh, a day and a half. Um, and so everybody wanted to be on the side of the cops. Everybody was like, yeah, I'll gladly shut myself in if you go find that bomber who is just one person. And, um, <laughs> well, potentially two, I guess, two people. But, um, I, you know, like the whole thing was set up, in my opinion. Um, never mind getting into the conspiracy theories, which is why we should have had Chris Cantwell on here. But um, I think that, you know, the whole thing was just kind of a setup so that the governor could take control of that area and have people submit. And now, now we're on to a year. A, almost two years later, and people are getting rip shit at cops. I, I love it. You know, so people flip-flop, and maybe they see uh, things neutrally. I want to give them the, the benefit of the doubt, but at the same time, in the end, um, why would you submit to not going outside of your own home, even two steps, apparently? You couldn't be on the street unless you had some reason. Or you're going to Dunkin' Donuts or something. Uh, no joke either. <laughs> no, I know. Um, so the funny thing is, it, it's not funny. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. Um, uh, Michael, I kind of want to go to you. What do you think about all of that? I mean, that's. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, like. I'm 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 asking, um, do people flip flop, or do do people think uh, neutrally, or do are they just status, or what? People, I mean, everybody flip flops. I flip flop. We all practice logical fallacies, whether we try to or not. Um, you know, I, I was going through this yesterday with something as silly as comic books. Like, I read this comic book yesterday about Superman. It's called, like, Superman Red Sun. And I, I'm a Marvel guy, and that's totally the opposite of what I do. I, I don't do see comics, and it's like this cognitive dissonance fallacy of, of... It is. No, it really is. It's like borders or patriotism or pack mentality. Like, I do Marvel rather than DC because I picked that team, right? Like, like I didn't build that. And uh, well, I guess that's different though because isn't uh, the quality of that comic uh, just? Do you like Marvel in general compared to DC, or are you yeah. just seriously a fanboy of Marvel for like well, no reason? Are we really gonna do comic book philosophy? Well, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yes, absolutely. Rich Pop, I hope you're watching right now. He's gonna be so proud. He's convincing me into DC. Look, I've been into Marvel comic books for, for about 20, 20 years now, man, and, and I have a lot of them, and, and th there's my, my friend Rich who works at Comic-Cons, and, and he, I think he's watching the show right now. He's like an anarchist, but he doesn't do philosophy, and he just doesn't care very much. Um, you oh, know, I, I am biased against DC comic books because when I was a kid, just like you guys with your sports teams or whatever, I, I picked my borders, right? And, and I read this comic book the other night, and I just tried to go into it with an open mind, just like I do when I read something like Baffinin or the Communist Manifesto, or whatever it is. Um, I just went into it with an open mind, and it was a cool spin on a, a boring story, in my opinion, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, you know? And I know you guys think that's boring. I see Marcel staring at his phone, but I, I do comic books pretty hardcore, and, and this was a big deal for me, you know? And... And I think that has to do with, with these same ideas of, of, of anarchy and, like, if you can't have an open mind, if you think that, that people are going to agree with you, you're going to have a really bad time once free society hits, I think. Um, we're not all going to agree on economics. We're not all, all going to agree on philosophy or politics or apolitics or comic books or freaking music. It doesn't really matter. Um, and that's why I, why I enjoy it so much, because I'm free to like my comics. I'm free to like my freedom. I'm free to like my Miller High Life and cannabis tea and stuff, right? Yeah. I know I just ranted and rambled right there, but that's... <laughs> I think it was beautiful, so... <laughs> <laughs> Nikki, what do you say? Well, um, so what I say is... I mean, if it was set up, then they picked the perfect place to do it um, because it's Boston. It's like the liberal capital of the world. I mean, just Cambridge alone is one of the most densely populated places in the entire world, and it is full of liberals. It is the People's Republic of Cambridge. Um, <laughs> and so I, I think that using the people of Cambridge and Boston as a sort of um, case study on people flip-flopping or how they feel about the police is in a way not really fair because, like I said, it's the liberal capital of the world. I mean, you look at, there's practically a college on every corner next to the Dunkin' Donuts that's also on every corner, <laughs> and all they see is liberal bullshit, really. <laughs> I mean, I've been to, God, four colleges. Um, with all my different degrees and stuff, and each one was exactly the same. No matter what your major is, you're mandated to take multicultural classes and diversity classes and world classes, feminism classes, yes, <laughs> women's studies, um, all of that stuff. So these people, they're sort of held by the hand the whole way and taught what to think. I mean, growing up, 
Um, I guess my dad is sort of a Republican, but I never knew that because Republicans were evil and everything was liberal or bust. There was no other option. So, <laughs> Republicans are kind of evil, though. <laughs> well, they are, but I tend to like them a little bit better than Democrats because um, they usually like guns. So, yeah, but they and, like bombs. Well, yes, they also like bombs, and that's really unfortunate, but yeah. I feel like they're a little easier to convert. But, um, oh, goodness, I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we're in in these these I don't know if it's the same at colleges everywhere, but in places like Massachusetts, we are not taught critical thinking. We are taught that these are the rules and this is what you follow, and that's how you get through life. So it, it seems natural that when all that stuff went down in Boston, everyone just sort of bowed down and clapped their hands and you know did the hokey pokey and, and went along with it. Yeah, um, it was absolutely sick. It, it, I'm, I'm gonna cut in. I'm gonna cut in. I've been wanting to. I've I've never been able to find the words for this, but I've been trying to directly ask you this question for getting on a year now. How do you, with your licensing and your legal hoops that that your career involves, and like I understand, I I I'm I know that you're a good person, and I'm I'm sure that you help people on a regular basis. If you have to jump through legal hoops to do that, right. cheers, right? Um. But how do you relate that to market anarchism? Like, how do you freedom through your job? Well, um, as of right now, I'm actually in a group private practice. Um, so we do take health insurances, but we also offer cash-only services. Um, we don't do barter because that's actually... <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask next. Do you accept... <laughs> Bitcoin, come on. Bitcoin. Um, I personally would. Uh, I'm not the owner of the practice, so I cannot make that decision because I do have to pay them rent, um, and they they pretty much just go through insurances and cash only. Um, if it was my own private practice, I would absolutely take Bitcoin or silver or gold, though I would never charge enough that someone could hand me a gold coin. In your... Um in your market, you know, could you could you legally accept Bitcoin for a practice like like that that's so heavily regulated? Um, yes, you could because you are allowed to set up a cash only practice. The issue with that is just you have to be really well known to be able to do it because you have to be able to get clients that would pay the price. Um, but. We, um, so, for an example, the average cost of a session would be $125, and that is just because if we ask that, insurances will give us like 60 or 70. Yeah. Um, but we do offer discounted rates for people that have high deductibles or that don't have insurance. Um, hey, that, this is way off topic. I was like only curious right. for me. You know, I'm sorry, yeah. but we should. We should. We should. We'll definitely. take it offline. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I don't remember what we were saying before, but definitely uh -huh. they are not given um, critical thinking skills uh, in Massachusetts. And the funny thing is, is so when they were out searching for this guy, I was actually driving around Cambridge and Watertown not knowing what was going on. And I was like, why is there all this traffic? Why is everyone going in this one direction? Um, and we were in the car, and my mom called me and asked me if I was okay. And I was like, why would I not be okay? And she's like, oh, well, you know, Boston is on lockdown, and no one is outside. And I was like, oh, well, I'm just driving in the car right now. And we were like two streets away from where it happened and where they found him. Um, oh. So, yeah, we were being anarchists without even knowing it and somehow didn't get caught. <laughs> I applaud you. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, cheers. There we go, Michael. My biggest impression of the uh, of the Boston bombing is it was the day before my uh, my felony trial, and the uh, and 
they actually had an FBI agent the day after the Boston bombing <laughs> testifying against me instead of investigating the damn bombing. And uh, and then just just for our audience, Rich, you know, Josh and I, and I'm sure Marcel are familiar with with your works. Um, but why is this person uh, messing with you again? This FBI agent uh, for selling cannabis. Okay. <laughs> wow. So. Yeah, and this was and this was a guy from the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Oh right. Apparently, right. He thought selling joints was joint terrorism. <laughs> I'm not going to get into definitives here, but I I would just like to say that for the record, we here at the Currency of Anarchy promote free trade in all shapes and forms. Agreed. And, uh, one thing that I did want to get out on this is. Uh, between Stacy Litz in uh, in Kansas, I think, um, who was arrested by FBI and eventually turned, and me, I've just heard about another case in Michigan where an activist uh, was targeted by the FBI for uh, actually a marijuana grower was a uh, legal one was convinced to bend the rules for a patient by an FBI Aren't you, um, aren't you from so be careful Michigan? in your personal life because there may be there may be people targeting you and I'm saying that to everybody on the show um, just so you know if you're an activist the FBI may be targeting you be careful <laughs> uh, there, there's a good book that uh, you boys down in Keene promote by Claire Wolf, I believe, called Rats. That's about narcs, agents, provocateur, similar infestations. Uh, you guys can look it up, check it out on online. It's kind of about how activists can deal with threats, you know, secret threats by the state. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a good book. Yeah. Uh, Marcel, anything? Um... For, uh, for, for as the Boston bombing goes, I mean, like I, um, um, uh, I, I was, I was like, you know, in college, um, or, or around then, and so like that, and like, um, one of my, one of my friends, uh, he, he was, he was a, uh, um, he was a big uh, Marxist, and so like that, so he was going around with a pole, uh, going around with like, you know, uh, like just, just like you know, a random like asking poll. And a lot of people thought it was like you know uh, right wing extremism, extremism and so with that, and uh, mom, and he even like you know said to me that if that mom, that if the uh, mom, that if the Boston bombers did not get their uh, rights read, then they would they would basically get off scot free, and mom, and yeah, like what what actually like you know went on uh, through the Boston bombing with the with the whole entire, like, you know, uh, search and seizure of trying to find that individual. Um, yeah, it, it, that, that was, um, that, that, that was way over the top. I mean, like, it was just, you know, um, it was, it was just, like, um, but, but when it comes to, like, the uh, flip-flopping, I'm not too sure of what the people in Boston actually be believe in now, but, but, yeah, like, some people, some people like you know, some people still hold the belief, the belief that that they would probably have been justified for like you know going into other people's houses because this mom, this person with a with a crock pot, mom was on the was on the loose, but yeah, I know home cooked food, yeah, <laughs> but but yeah, that's. Um, it's just, it was just what a ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the thing is, uh, I I remember that day um, that that happened. I was at work and I was working at a retail store at the time. Were you in Massachusetts when this happened? Oh yeah, yeah. I was oh, in nice. Salem. Well, Salem, I guess not nice. But. Right. I was like, what is that? Four or five towns north, uh, just north of Lynn, by the way. <laughs> okay. Lynn, Lynn, um, city of sin. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I just remember all of that happening. And they were saying, "Hey, we're gonna close down all that surrounding area." And I had a few friends, uh, for example, in Watertown, and um, 
they were like, oh, you know, don't get mad at them. And um, I remember uh, one of my friends was uh, one of the police officers that was doing one of the raids or raiding. And um, I, you know, come to find out later, his brother uh, doesn't even approve of that. I, I just think that it, it's it's that personal. You know, like um, a lot of us uh, had friends or relatives in the 9-11 thing as well. And so people get personal with it. And I, I try to, you know keep my emotions out of it to think, hey, what's going to happen down the road? What's the long-term thing that's going to happen? I, uh, as opposed to what's right now? What, what do you want to happen? You know what I mean? I'm not very good at this yet, but I, I, I very much try to be a creature of logic rather than emotion. Right. And I slip up sometimes. Like I just mentioned in my... <laughs> pointless rants about comic books a few minutes ago that made no sense whatsoever. Um, you know, I, 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 have, I suffer cognitive dissonance sometimes, and I, I use fallacies sometimes, and I get emotional sometimes, right? We all do, and if I think that if you say you are solely a creature of logic that you are a liar. Um, right. But when it really comes to, to the Boston Marathon for me, I was in Rhode Island at the time. I was an hour, what, two hours away. And I did. I was not aware of that until maybe two weeks later, I believe. <laughs> and what? when I heard about it, I thought it was some big atrocity and some. Ter I don't even own a TV. I don't. I do not mainstream media, man. I don't. Um, so at the time, I thought all kinds of terrible things. I probably might have even believed loosely believe the narrative, which I do not anymore. I, I, but I don't have a stance. I have no idea what happened. Like, in hindsight, that's just typical government shenanigans. I'm not surprised. I'm not impressed. I'm not let down. That's just what the state does. Like, they use guns and take over your area and you steal, steal or utilize your property or seize your property. That's what they do. I, I'm not surprised or slighted in the least by this. This is this is how the state operates. Right. Yeah, absolutely. One of the weird oh, sorry. Go ahead. One of the weird moments that I had, um, speaking of things being personal, um, I think I, oh I was at the gym actually and my gym's a terrible place because it's filled with TVs that play nothing but soap operas and liberal news stations. And, you know, I've got my headphones in, I'm not really paying attention, and I look up on the TV, and there's a picture of the apartment building next door to where I lived when I lived in Quincy, and there's these headlines about be it being raided in connection to the Boston bombing. Um, <laughs> and I forget if it was, like, if it was his brother or their friend or whatever, but they the FBI showed up and, and raided the apartment building next to mine. I hadn't lived there for a few months um, actually, maybe even like a year, but um, it was really bizarre because I looked up and I'm like, why Why is this on the TV? <laughs> and then I read the little scrolling thing underneath and I was like, oh. So it's, you can't live in this area and not know someone who was involved somehow. It seems like everyone was involved or their friend was involved or their neighbor was involved. Yeah. Um, and yet everyone thinks that what happened is okay. Right, right. I drove through Massachusetts yesterday with my my anarchist friend Adam, and we were we went we were only in Seekonk, so we were in Massachusetts for about eleven minutes, <laughs> um, just to come back down here to Bristol. And we were breaking even between Rhode Island and Massachusetts, and Rhode Island is one of the bluer states, right? Not compared to Mass so much, but we we were we had. The, in between Rhode Island and Massachusetts, we had at least four illegal things in the car, and, and some of them were f felony level, you know. And, and this is just driving through a geographical location. Like, why does morality change from this border to this border? You know, it's a good question. It doesn't. It doesn't. That's right. exactly right. Right. Um, yeah, I think I'll take a minute just to go over the currency, if you don't mind. The last time we did the show, it was uh, the 29th. Uh, today is January 5th. Uh, took these prices actually during the taping at 9.31. Uh, so 
silver was 1586. Uh, tonight it's 1618. So that's a change of 32 cents, which is a 2% change. Gold was uh, 1185.75. Tonight it's 1204.21. That's a $18.46 change, 1.6%. Uh, and Bitcoin was uh, 313.38. Tonight it's 273.06. So that's down $40.32. That's 12.9%. That seems a little steep percentage wise. But. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the currency or the hard money, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, I honestly just want to keep on going with uh, what we've been talking about, though. Um, and kind of, I kind of want to switch it out, uh, switch it up a little bit. Um, I want to talk about uh, the books that got me into liberty or uh, minarchy. Uh, and then I went to anarchy. But um, what took me to minarchy was hey, Ron Paul. When I just for our, our, our newer guests and, and, and some of the newer viewers who, who, don't, who might not know this, the currency of anarchy was initially called the currency of democracy. Right. Could you explain that to us uh, yeah, for the record? Yeah, yeah, let's go over the history of that. Um, so the currency of democracy was a project that I started uh, after I, um, you know, became politically aware, as it were. Uh, that was in 2008, after Obama and McCain had their um, debacle with the banks. The banks uh, swayed them to vote for the bailouts, and they were telling everybody that they were going to vote against the bailouts, but both of them voted for it. So that broke me out of that paradigm of the left and right, the, the crap, you know, the one-party system, as it were. And um, so eventually I came upon Ron Paul and libertarian party stuff, so minarchy, uh, and that's when I started the currency of democracy based on uh, Thomas Jefferson's quote, information is the currency of democracy. So... Uh, I, I did that for about four or five years in Danvers. Uh, that was at DCAT. It was a, it's a public access station. And um, eventually, during that time, I came upon anarchism, so, so actual liberty. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eventually. Like, uh, so I ran, up, ran across uh, Stephen Molyneux, um, and he basically got me into actual anarchism. Um, Larkin Rose was in the mix a little bit, uh, a few other people, uh, but basically I, I did some reading and a lot of that show and it, you know, you see my progression and get me out of that belief system. So uh, I turned the show into a web show, this is the currency of anarchy now. So that's, that's the history of the show. Um, I. I did only two or three shows uh, by myself, and then I had a uh, host prior to Michael. Michael came upon the show about three or four months ago. That That's about right. So, yeah, that's that. Um, the first couple books that got me uh, into minarchy and liberty, uh, you know, as a general concept, uh, was Ron Paul's book, Liberty Defined. And um, Judge Napolitano's book, It's Dangerous to Be Right When the Government is Wrong. I'm not sure if you've heard of these books, but uh, these are just uh, general outlines. You know, um, uh, actually, Judge Napolitano's book, he kind of bullet points all of the uh, ways that the Constitution is violated. And it's like, okay, yeah, we should stick to the Constitution. And then you start thinking outside the box, and hey, why would the government actually, you know, enforce a law upon itself? Um, that just doesn't make much sense. So that's anarchism. And um, for the moral argument, I got into UPB, uh, Universally Preferable Behavior, by Stephen Molyneux. Um, so that's the, you know, he tries to set up the moral argument. For, um, you know, objective morality, and 
uh, it's a good start, but you know, it's not the whole thing, and it's not. He's not actually making the moral argument. He's just uh, thinking logically about it. So that that was my take. This is how, you know, for the most part, I got into libertarian thought in general. Um, but uh, I, I want to know more about you guys. Um, you know, I know Luis himself has uh, been into uh, anarchism, and I believe it was through your family. Is that correct? Um, well, yes and no. I, I, um, my, my parents were, I mean, they tried to raise me, you know, like probably most people, you know, um, do no harm but take no shit kind of thing. Um, but uh, it was interesting because I think that the very first person that I saw talking about this kind of stuff was the Tom Woods on YouTube. And from then on, you know, I devoured everything, and the rabbit trail went on from um, um, Ron Paul and um, Lou Rockwell's, you know, Molyneux as well, and then Jeffrey Tucker, Jeff Berwick, Doug Casey. So, I mean, I, I've i read a few books, but I've devoured all the YouTubes. And, I mean, my, my commute to work is about an hour to an hour and a half, so, you know, I will just put my headphones on and put my iPhone and just listen to the whole thing, you know, for my whole commute and just listen to all that stuff. And, I mean, I had the time, so I mean, it was a little bit hard to read. I mean, unless I was, you know, pooping at 6 in the morning, you know, I really didn't have a lot of time to, <laughs> to do the reading. So, um, so but, I mean, my iPhone and, and YouTube were basically my, my books at the time. Um, so that's that's how um, everything started. And... and partially because, um, you know, like I was telling you guys a couple weeks ago, um, I, I started uh, working as a social worker slash translator, and I just wanted to, you know, change the world and help the poor and all this and that, but then I just saw how, you know, because of the government grants, we were really not helping people, we were just disempowering them, mm -hmm. so that kind of uh, helped me wake up a little bit in that realm, and... Um, from then, uh, you know, I somehow got dragged into um, uh, teaching plans. So, you know, after a bunch of San Pedro and Ayahuasca, um, I was able to see all this from from a, um, an introspective perspective uh, that helped me uh, understand this. Uh, basically, you know, like every every shamanic session was like a whole freaking master's course on, on economics or politics so it, it was uh, pretty heavy duty stuff um, and you know I, I mean like after several um, experiences of death and rebirth and like just seeing how the whole system works it just clicked in my head and like you know basically like one of my latest um, ayahuasca ceremonies she said you know you, you you need to empower others and you cannot like really go super far without empowering people so it helped me see that yeah I had a really great coaching growing up but I couldn't go farther if I didn't support others so from there is when I saw the idea or, or more the vision that we're all interconnected so uh, and how this uh, government idea is more like an exoskeleton that prevents us from growing. So we need to shed that exoskeleton to be able to allow uh, um, spontaneous order from happening. I mean, to to, to happen. So um, I think if I mean, you're uh, teaching yourself, or if you teach others, you're reinforcing what you already know within yourself. It kind of helps. Like uh, it strengthens your point. Um, also, um, yeah. uh, just to um, put it across, uh, I used to yeah, listen yeah, to the Mises audio good. daily, like uh, for like a year or two, like on end, like uh, whatever was on their uh, RSS feed, I would just listen to it. Uh, do you, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, Mises.org. Uh, they have uh, contributors, um, you know, and they have. Um, uh, people reading uh, different articles, you know, just reading it, and uh, they create a uh, MP3 that you can download and just listen to it every day, almost every day. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty. Anyway, cheap. Um, yeah, Nikki, um, what what do you have to um, present to us?
Um, I guess I'm sort of a bad anarchist because I haven't really read a whole lot. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Um, I can't say that I arrived here by myself because that's not what happened. Really what happened um, was my fiancé, who I had just started dating at the time, was reading Ron Paul's book. And then he told me all about Ron Paul's book. Um, and then he'd be working in his office, and I'd walk in, and he'd be listening to um, The Law, the audiobook. Um, so I would sit in there and listen to it, even though I missed the first like five or ten minutes. Um, I did read um, Larkin Rose's um, The Iron Web. Um, and the questions that he asked in, in that book and, and how he pointed out um, government and, and how it works and the things that government does and the transformation of the characters in that book is actually what clicked for me and made me say, oh, um, you know, maybe anarchy and, and voluntarism is really the way to go. Um, and then once I hit that point, I did, um, I've read a lot of Rothbard, his essays, um, and the transcripts, transcripts, I'm sorry, of his lectures. Um, usually what would happen is someone would say, oh, well, in anarchy, how will you solve this problem or solve that problem? Because we're expected to suddenly solve all of the world's problems, even though government <laughs> doesn't solve any so I was like, well, I bet Rothbard has an answer for that. And so I would Google and usually end up on um, the Mises website, I think, um, or like Lou Rockwell or wherever else, and I would read a transcript of one of his lectures, and I'd be like, well, if you look at this paragraph, um, particularly I, I reference him a lot when I'm talking about courts and arbitration and how... Anarchy isn't going to be just this Wild West, everybody blowing each other's heads off because someone stole something. Um, so I do reference Rothbard a lot. I, I look to him mostly, I think. Um, and I did download um, a few audiobooks, um, Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Admittedly, I never finished it. <laughs> but I, I got most of the way through. Um, and also Rothbard's um, The Case Against the Fed. Um, I believe that was the title. I definitely I downloaded that as well um, when I wanted to learn more about economics. So mostly I would say that um, uh, philosophically and literature-wise, I'm mostly a Rothbard and Larkin Rose person. I never really could get into Molyneux, I think mostly because his videos are all like an hour long. And I I sort of I'm always like, okay, I'm I'm gonna do Molyneux today. And I go and hit play and it sort of meanders on and then ten minutes. So I'm like, you know what, that's enough. I think I get it. Uh, so. Yeah, and it's the same image over and over again. His bald head. <laughs> yes, yes, and he sort of makes this weird face when he like looks at the camera, and he's so dramatic. I did watch this video about um, like a spanking study. I did watch that one because I think it was like ten minutes, and there is one video. Um, that uses like Minecraft imagery to talk about mm -hmm. how the government just keeps adding more solutions that don't actually fix the problem. Yeah. Um, and it talked about like Galileo and stuff. I did watch that one because his face wasn't on it, <laughs> and there were graphics. So yeah, I guess I'm a bad anarchist because I don't really follow anyone or anything. Uh, that's all good. Hard. <laughs> As an anarchist, you shouldn't follow anybody. You just yes. yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. probably makes That's you a good anarchist. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, Marcel Rich. Um, I'd I'd say that my my first uh, my first introduction into the well into liberty for, first was probably uh, I went through the uh, conspiracy theorist. Phase and saw it that here and there. Like I, uh, I listened to Alex Jones and I, uh, I basically got into like the conspiracy theories 
And then I, and that was just for a little bit. And once I got to uh, Ron Paul and so with that, that actually got me on to more of like you know, um, and pl and plus what actually got me straight onto like you know free market economics was uh, through Peter Schiff. I mean like, um, I saw that he like went down to Occupy Wall Street, and I was an Occupy Wall Street supporter at the time, and. Uh, and I saw that he was representing the one percent, so I said, hmm, maybe I should like you know check this video out just to make to like uh, open my mind a little bit. And then I like you know saw like you know his arguments, and he was like you know straight on, and I liked it about that. So I got on, I got onto that, and then um, and then once the 2012 elections came, and I went. Uh, and then uh, I saw that Ron Paul didn't won the the uh, the nomination at the RNC, so I went straight into Gary Johnson. And then uh, and then Gary Johnson had win, and I got I, I was like you know losing faith with the system. And uh, um, and then basically I saw I saw like you know Adam Kokesh's videos on like you know volunteerism and uh, and anarcho capitalism. And I was like, you know, a little curious about it, so I went down to Anarchy NYC down in 2013, um, uh, ironically on uh, 420, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and basically I saw Adam Kokesh. I've li I've actually even you know met Stefan Molyneux, and uh, I met Larkin Rose for the first time. I did not know who he was at the f at, um, though then, but once I read his, once I actually got his books. That is when I actually di really discovered him, and then basically, uh, and basically, like I saw like n numerous of like you know, um, I, I even met you know Christopher Campbell for the first time there too. That was amazing too. Like and then that basically sealed the deal right there. I was an anarchist right then and there. Like that just basically sealed the deal. Right on. Hmm. Yeah, Rich. Well, let's see. I'm I'm old, so uh, <laughs> there. In uh, in 1992, I voted for Bill Clinton, um, and uh, before that, there there were times in my life when I would have self-identified as a socialist. Um, I was so disgusted with Clinton that in 1996, I voted for Harry Brown even though I, I wasn't yet a believer in free market economics, I was disgusted enough with the government, with what the government was doing, that my reaction was kind of, oh God, even no government at all would be better than the government we have, because at least it wouldn't do any harm. Right. Um, and so, I guess from, from that thought on, you could say that I was an anarchist, but my intellectual journey was a lot longer than that. Then I started arguing economics with libertarians, trying to turn them into like libertarian socialists of some sort, and they kept quoting The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith at me. Um, and the quotations were very difficult to argue with, and they, they were also really beautifully written. So I said, okay, I'm going to read this damn book and debunk it. So my first introduction to uh, economics was The Wealth of Nations. And I, 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 the language was good, good for me because I had previously read all the works of Shakespeare. So, you know, I had no problem with the period language. And, and also I'd read a lot of the Founding Fathers stuff. So I, uh, so anyway, I read that. And that turned me uh, 180 degrees on the issue of free market economics. By the time I tried to debunk it, and it just debunked me. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so then I, I, uh, I was, I had been introduced to Ayn Rand, but I reread some Ayn Rand in the view of my new knowledge of how market economies work. And I actually understood Atlas Shrugged much better, so I went went through some of that. And then I went through, you know, my kind of objectivist phase where I ran around saying mean things about poor people because I blamed them. 
until I realized that they were the people with absolutely the least power in the <laughs> fucking system. They were exactly the last people who should ever be paying for the rat. Yeah. You know, Josh, we need to make it by the fucking system, and now it's giving them a crutch, and <laughs> and the Republicans begrudge them that, and it's like, well, well, no, it's just like let's just not make any more people who can't cope with life. <laughs> You know, let's, let's make people can cope with life, and that'll be better, you know. <laughs> but, so anyway, I went through my angry objectivist phase, and uh, then during the time I had, I had a, a wife die of cancer without, um, without, uh, being able to use medical marijuana, and I was very angry at, at there were, I'm not going to get into her medical shit, but there were many ways that the state intervened in her medical care that I believed contributed to her death, including uh, absolutely refusing to allow her to use an experimental uh, drug. So at that point, I, I was kind of getting into militia territory, and I was really... I was angry to the point where I actually considered um, doing something, you know. I don't know what. I didn't get that far. But after she died, I kind of wanted to go out in a blaze of glory for a little while. Um, and uh, then that kind of passed when, when I was introduced to Ron Paul in 2008. And all of a sudden, here's this guy who's saying the right things and people are actually listening. Yeah. And it was like, holy shit, maybe there's hope. You know, maybe let's, let's see where we can go with this. So I, I, I shifted kind of from LP to... To, uh, to uh, the doctor cured me uh, to, to some extent. And so I got into the Ron Paul movement and through that met back up with economics because I'd read Friedman, but then I started reading Austrian economics because of Ron Paul. And uh, and he that kind of turned me from a monetarist into an Austrian. I've been all over the place, you know. I think I'm approaching the truth, but but I'm I'm way too old to think I have it. Um, and then moving to New Hampshire and actually living amongst agorists was the thing that finally moved me all the way to anarchy. That and getting arrested and seeing the system from the inside as an, as, as an activist. Because when I started the 420 rally, I still wasn't an anarchist. I was just a really weird... I don't know. Uh, I logged under the term <laughs> radical centrist because it's like... I don't know that. Given... Uh, issue, I was either way to the right of the Democrats, <laughs> way to the right of the Republicans, or I was <laughs> way to the left of the Democrats. <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of, a, so, so I don't know, I think that's kind of a cute idea. Cute. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But that's kind of my journey in a, in a nutshell. I'm now pretty much a confirmed agorist um, slash uh, anarcho-capitalist because, you know, agorism is a transitional philosophy, but where you're going is anarcho-capitalism once the state is gone, yeah. um, for all intents and purposes. They're indistinguishable in practice. Um, but at the same time, I recognize that even if the state were going to collapse tomorrow, okay, if the state just disappeared, somebody pushed the magic go away state button and, and the whole thing disappeared, well, the reality is while 99% of your neighbors want a state, you are going to have a state. And if you try to stop them from establishing that state, they will kill you and then they will establish their state. And So we have to we, run away. We Out of Massachusetts. <laughs> like 20, at least 50% anarchists 
the general population in order to sustain an anarchist society that was not at perpetual war with itself. So mm -hmm. while I'm an anarchist, I will do things like go out and try to minimize the state as much as I can through in-system activism and through civil disobedience and through any other tactic that crosses my mind that I think might somehow by some stretch of the imagination work because you know I'll you know I'll, I'll try anything if I think it'll work yeah but I recognize that the state's going to be with us probably for a long probably for a long time and that we have to as much as possible keep it out out of our out of our lives while it exists so I, I applaud organizations like the ACLU still for at least keeping the government enough off our backs that we're not all dead um, right. so I guess <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just uh... I'll, I guess I'm, I'm just going to finish this segment up real quick because we're way over. And I went from young punk rock anarchist who had no idea what the word meant to joining the military, nationalist, uh, globalist, really, uh, you know, imperialist. And then I went to conspiracy theories and then Rand Paul and then Ron Paul and then Mises and then Hayek and then Rothbard and then black flags all over the place. Um, the the literature that that really sparked my interest at first was The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose. I think that's one of the best novels, the best pieces of, of writing that I've ever seen in my life. It's beautifully uh, beautifully done, really really quick, really easy and straight to the point. Um, I would bring up the most... I just did, I'm sorry. I would bring up Anatomy of the State by Murray Rothbard, and I would probably bring up uh, Freedom by Adam Kokesh is a pretty good one, or The Theory of Money and Credit by Ludwig von Mises. Oh, yeah. Mises is really, really good. And these are all really easy books to read, really short, really yeah, straight to the point. If you want to give this to some of your friends who are starting to consider these ideas, they're really good tools. But we really got to cut this over, so that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, sounds good. Let's uh, let's give uh, like a good thirty seconds for everybody. Uh, just you know, your most important websites or whatever you want to go to. Marcel, uh, what do you want to say? Thirty seconds. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to um, see how, what, what I'm what, what I'm about, just follow my Facebook page, um, LGBT for Gun Rights. Or if you want to follow my personal Facebook page, you can. I believe that there is like you know some people deleted so if you want to add me then that's mom mom then that's your volition but if you want to follow me then so be it <laughs> yeah rich um let's see well my my up and coming thing is I'm going to be executive director of the New Hampshire Jury Association um and that's nhjury.com we do jury nullification and we're also going to work on expanding the right to jury trial. And uh, so check out nhjury.com, and uh, there will be big changes there soon. You guys aren't going to plug Free Keen or any of those organizations okay. while you're sitting I, in the KAC? I will do that. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're absolutely <laughs> right. The other thing is, as always, it's kind of woven into the fabric of my life that that uh, the Free State Project. If if you're not in New Hampshire, uh, check out New Hampshire. Come out to Liberty Forum. Come yeah. out to Pork Fest. Uh, you'll love it here. Or even or even just come here and just see like the activism that's going on, and seeing like you know, and, vi and even visit the CAC if you want. Yeah. Yeah. If and if you're expecting the shit to hit the fan, it's it's some comfort to be surrounded by well-armed and like-minded individuals. <laughs>
And, 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 and there are places in New Hampshire where I can go and have that, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, you can check out my website at thelibertydoll.com, or you can um, find me on Facebook as The Liberty Doll. Um, I have a Twitter and a YouTube and some other stuff, but I don't really use it all that often. I'm hoping to make some more videos soon. Um, but yes, definitely thelibertydoll.com and um, facebook.com slash thelibertydoll. Right. So 30 seconds, uh, just please um, subscribe to Emancipated Human on uh, YouTube. We have a, an Emancipated Human on Facebook and emancipatedhuman.com. Um, there's a ton of stuff that we do. It's not just liberty uh, stuff. I mean, it has to do with liberty, but the whole idea is uh, try to feature things, uh, more um, applicable examples instead of a bunch of theories. So uh, look us up, and I really appreciate you guys for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, Michael, uh, who do we have uh, next week? We've got Lance Davis. What's yeah, Lance, yes, Lance, Lance Davis comes on next week. Um, in October uh, in 2014, him and his wife Susie and their children's house was more or less raided. Um, the police came there without a warrant and walked into their house more or less bullied their way through the house, scared scared the children into the corner, and uh, they they were there on a an anonymous tip that there was a wanted felon in the house who my friend Lance had never heard of. So recently he was plugged on coplock.com, or I'm sorry, coplock.org, you might know it on Facebook, or from the Keen Activist Center, as a matter of fact. Um... And he was plugged on there, and it, you know, did the viral thing. So, and even if it didn't, I think that's just a good topic. It's a, it's a good thing to talk about. He was a direct victim of police brutality. Right. Yeah, that's uh, going to be pretty intense, and uh, that's going to be uh, next Monday, which is January twelfth at nine o'clock p.m. Eastern. Uh, that will be six p.m. Pacific. This show right here should be up on Wednesday, uh, the 7th, and that'll be at 3 p.m. on Voluntary Virtues, youtube.com slash user slash Voluntary Virtues. And um, we should be getting, uh, we do have podcasts uh, being created as we speak, and um, I, am, I got my laptop back, so I will be coding the website. Uh, um, I've got a lot of the back-end stuff up or um, uh, ready, so I'm just trying to get everything uh, combined and coordinated and designed, uh, the graphic nature of it. So that will be coming up pretty soon. Um, so yeah, just uh, stick around. We're uh, growing, and I'm very uh, appreciative of you all watching, and uh, I know Michael is as well. So uh, yeah, stick around and uh, take care, everybody. We'll see you next time.